So brain health forecast by the year 2020, I hope I'm not giving away the punchline here, $6 billion. It's fascinating to me uh, when I heard that. Um, I, I was kind of surprised, to be honest with you, because I've been following the, uh, the brain fitness market for, for a while, having come from the kind of aging, aging space. And no longer is this category just about brain fitness. We're talking diagnostics, biometric measurements, and brains powering stuff, lots of stuff. And we had some really interesting companies at CES this year um, that were kind of like the, the favorites of the show, people powering things with little antennas on their heads. Anyway, um, with that said, I'm bringing to you today a very old, very old friend of mine. Oh, oh okay, sorry, I have like people waving to me back there. Sorry. Um, and um, it's from my, my, my past life at Gilbert Guide. And I'm really lucky to have him here speaking on this very market. There is seriously no better person to be doing it. He is the man to give you the insights on the power of this particular market. So I want to welcome to you, welcome and introduce Alvaro Fernandez, who's the CEO of Sharp Brains. Fun fact about him, five year, his five-year-old daughter often beats him in all kinds of card games. So he's uh, questioning his own cognitive power. And in order to provide you an additional mental challenge for this show, he is going to choose to deliver his talk with a very funny Spanish accent. Thank you, Gail. Okay, I will try not, not to, to move. Um, no, the phone is not here. I don't even have it. Let's see. But I need the, the clicker for the slides. Any idea what the interference, maybe? Anyway, okay, now sounds better. Yeah, sounds good now. It's an opportunity to be here with all of you. I think what we're going to discuss the next 15, 20 minutes is very complementary to the first session. So the first session, I think, and a lot of what happens in this health innovation event and genetics is more bottom up. Is how can we change genes? How can we change epigenetics? Hopefully that will transmit into enhanced cognition, better lifestyle, better outcomes. I'm going to talk the other way. I'm going to talk top down. I'm going to talk how we can apply what we learn from neuropsychology, from cognitive neuroscience, and I think that top-down and bottom-up approaches, they're going to really mix together to deliver real personalized medicine. I don't think in terms of brain health, genes are ever going to be enough to be truly predictive and useful. If we combine genes with top-down neuropsychological assessments and measures and big data applied to behavioral health, I think that is where the opportunity is. Uh, before I start, I don't know if Dave is still here, maybe he left for the uh, little break, but he made a little joke about his age and memory, and that's why he had the notes. So I can tell him that I brought a book for him. <laughs> so this, we just published a synthesis of all the science behind cognitive health and how to self-monitor and self-enhance cognitive health, so I hope he and others will enjoy it. So what are we going to do today? First of all, I have to figure out how to use the clicker, which I did. So what is new? What are we even talking about this? So one, today we know the brain is more flexible, more plastic than ever we thought possible. There is new neurons being created in your brains every single day. Best estimate we have come across right now is two to 5,000 new neurons are being created every single day in most of our brains. And not only that, but lifestyle, such as aerobic exercise, can enhance that rate of neurogenesis. We also know that what we think, what we do, what we feel every day influences where those new neurons go, how they hook with existing circuits, and how long they survive. So if this is true, it makes us rethink what is brain health, 
how do we harness those properties to maximize health and to delay decline. We also know about the new NIH evidence review in 2010 that basically used exactly the same outcome measures to review all the evidence, invasive or non-invasive, to prevent or delay either cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease. And what was fascinating is that they found non-invasive interventions led by aerobic exercise and cognitive exercise to be more effective than any invasive intervention, from supplements to drugs to any kind of traditional medicine. So we have to, again, rethink what are we going to do about how to enhance, monitor uh, brain health. Finally, and this is why we are here, digital health, is because digital innovation allows us, for the first time, to scale what used to be delivered in a one-to-one -one, uh, neuropsychological or therapy context to millions of people worldwide who just had internet access in a very inexpensive way. So this is a synthesis of that NIH study I mentioned. All of these, we have a lot of information in our website, sharbrains.com, but this is very interesting. So again, they analyze all randomized con co trials that track people over a period of time and try to see what helps to prevent or delay cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see, what was pretty surprising is that they found many of the things that consumers tend to do, like supplements or ginkgo biloba, do not work. Instead, that cognitive training, which was fully computerized. So you can think, when these things become better validated, better standardized, it's going to be a new category of medical intervention. Cognitive training was one of the most proven interventions to delay cognitive decline. Not to stop any pathology, but to delay the symptoms. And also, many of the traditional interventions that doctors even today are prescribing in terms of cognitive health also show no association. So we have to really rethink fundamentally what we are doing. And this is the summary of my talk today. So what I want to say is first, there is a demand, a huge demand for new brain health innovation driven by consumers. We have an aging population who realizes, one, the brain is not as active or functional as it used to be. Second, that the current medical model is not working, is not delivering the value they want. So there is latent and experienced demand for innovation. Supply is small, but as Gis, as Gis mentioned, it's really growing very quickly. But what is left is a huge opportunity, a huge gap for everyone in this room to think how to fill it. So this is going to be my brief talk today. What is the demand? What is some supply guidelines and trends right now? And what is the opportunity for all of you interested in this, how to explore it, how to partner, how to move? We conduct, we are a market research company. So we do a lot of market surveys, focus groups, this is, comes from a survey we ran earlier last year. We had 3,000 early adopters and influencers respond. So it was pretty large. It's not representative of population at large, but of this select group. Most people thought that it's already time for health overall to really incorporate brain health in a more systematic manner. Right now, it's more a byproduct. You do the heart health. We know heart health contributes to brain health, but do we keep brain health in seriously? Often not. We don't know exactly how to deal with emotional issues. The DSM, now the whole DSM-5 debacle or controversy, is many areas are pre-scientific, I would say. So many people thought we, start to, we have to start adding brain health to the mainstream health toolkit using the same standards of care, the same uh, criteria. The next two data were pretty surprising to us. One is 83% said that they would personally take a brief assessment every year as an annual brain health checkup. And that idea, that idea comes in every survey we do, every focus groups. People subjectively, even the little joke that Dave mentioned, we feel things get better, some things get worse, but where do we have the objective data to really know what is improving or not? 
and truly to track ourselves over time so we have a baseline, we can see how the baseline goes, because that's critical not only from a consumer perspective, but from a doctor perspective. So right now, cognitive impairments, Alzheimer's, they are not properly diagnosed. What we need is the indiv intra-individual variation to really know if that individual has declined suddenly cognitive performance or is well above the norm in his age group, but still is way lower than he was three years ago. So people are looking for innovation to help them better self-monitor cognitive health, and doctors are also looking for that. And I will mention a couple of examples of what is already happening. And the other linked data point, also 83%, is what G also referred to as brain fitness. It's a culture, it's a movement very similar to physical fitness 40 years ago. Some early adopters being more active about their bodies for different reasons. The same thing is starting to happen now with brain fitness. So still it's a consumer-led culture, but more and more we think it's going to interface with more established medicine and health. The context is we live longer lives than ever and the peak of our performance in terms of brain health is often in our mid to late 30s. So 50 years ago or 100 years ago, this was less important, right? Because if I'm about to die in five years, why do I care about a slow cognitive decline? But if I'm going to live 50 more years and I have to stay productive and working and taking care of my family, well, this is something to start paying attention to. And people are, people are realizing that this is something new to consider. And this is the opportunity from a health perspective is to deliver a true continuum of care that starts when people are young, that then helps to maximize performance, that trajectory I discussed earlier, because that's good both for the individual and for the system. From the individual point of view, it helps them be better adapted to the environment, to be more successful, more productive, feel better, feel well, and that delays the onset of disease. And right now, this is the best way to prevent Alzheimer's disease, for example, at the population level, because we have no idea how to prevent the pathology, but we know how to delay the onset of symptoms. The Rand Corporation, three, I think it was maybe two or three months ago, published a study showing that the cost of taking care of dementia patients today was already higher than all cardiovascular diseases. And not only that, but that cost is going to more than double in 30 years. So it's time for us to really think in a more systematic way how health systems are going to take care of brain health. And people, consumers, already are demanding these solutions, these innovation for, uh, from us. So who is now stepping up and offering those kind of solutions that people are looking for? We published a report uh, this year, we do a huge study every two years where we review the science, new technology, new marketplace trends, uh, and we coined the movement or the new toolkit, Digital Brain Health. So digital health, we know what it is. We thought that's missing the brain, so let's call it Digital Brain Health. But the point is, what are the web-based or hardware or software or mobile tools that can help either monitor, assess, or enhance brain functioning across the whole lifespan. And we saw for the first time a lot of biometrics that used to be a bit more fishy, a bit more research with very questionable science is starting to become very well validated. So this is a new toolkit and that's the way I think to think of it. It's not a magic pill, it's not going to replace anything we already do, but it's going to complement what we already do and enhance it. There, are, we track like close to 200 companies worldwide. These are the ones, and I'm going to mention a few examples. Uh, the, the ones that we track, what is the market momentum and the research momentum of all these companies to try to predict which ones are more likely to succeed, are going to go public, are worthy of partnerships, business development for people like, like your companies. So those are in kind of gold, yellow letters, are the ones that were the top five, and then the other ones were the, the other 10 companies. And you have heard of, for example, Catherine Calarco, 
from HeartMath. I don't know if she's here. You heard her talk yesterday. They are one of the companies. But these companies, what they do in very good ways, and they already have proven the model to actually disseminate and to be sustainable, is they do well one of two things. One, either they assess and monitor brain functioning in very efficient ways, or they help enhance targeted brain functions. A few examples. So let me talk a couple of examples from the UK. Um, one, Cambridge Cognition, they just went public, by the way, two months ago in the London market. Uh, market cap is maybe 20 to 30 million pounds, depends on the, on the day. But they have automated neuropsychological assessments that traditionally have been used in clinical trials and in research environments. For the first time now, they have released a tablet-based memory screening that already is being used by hundreds of doctors and health professionals in the US, to, in, in the UK, to replace the mini mental. The mini mental, which most people in the US still use, and is outdated, is not very precise, has a lot of problems. Well, if we had a tablet to do that screening, you can analyze that data, you can be more precise, you can track that data over time, you can have all that data into a database in order to analyze at the population level what seems to be happening with all these patients, how they respond to different treatments. So they are getting very good traction doing that. And, and the company you cannot see here called Cog State from Australia is doing something very similar with Merck. Merck in Canada is distributing a tablet-based memory screening tool among uh, doctors, primary care doctors in Canada, for the same reason. All the ways to diagnose cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's make little sense and tablet-based screenings can be extremely effective and extremely efficient and inexpensive. The other example from the, from the UK, Ultrasys, that's a small company, also public, their, their tool is cognitive uh, behavioral ther therapy, fully computerized. Their main pro product is called Beating the Blues, but I mention it because the NHS in the UK adopted that tool five years ago as the first line treatment for anxiety and depression. And if the patient does not respond to that, then they get the antidepressant, then they got other kind of therapies. But at the, at the system, that's where I think we're going to evolve towards. There will be different life lines of intervention. The first ones will be non-invasive because they have no side effect and they're more empowering for the consumer or the patient. If those don't work, then we'll graduate to the medicament, which is different from what we do in the US today. A couple of other examples, now from the intervention side. So from the intervention side, positive science, maybe some of you may be familiar, they got a lot of press in the US over the last few years. They are trying to get the FDA approve one protocol of cognitive training as a treatment for schizophrenia. And they already are very advanced in this process. Another company uh, called Attentive, which comes out of a partnership between Duke and the Singaporean government, is developing a protocol based on what is called quantitative EEG, it's a kind of brain wave, in, as a FDA treatment for ADHD. And again, those things are already happening under the radar, so in a few years, we're going to have FDA actually approve non-invasive uh, tools for some of these uh, traditionally uh, ignored or problems only dealt through drugs. Um, another quick example, two quick examples. Newer Sky and Emotive, they have very inexpensive, mostly consumer-driven EEG headsets that they are collecting huge amounts of data of brain activity, brain function, and with that data, they can truly start to predict who may respond to what intervention, to refine diagnostics, and that still is under the radar. When I come to many health conferences, no one is talking about that. I think it's going to really change the way we deal with brain health, behavioral health, and mental health. There are many other examples, but those are just a few I wanted to, to share. So what is the gap? What's the opportunity? If there is this, that demand and there is supply relatively small, let me also reinforce a couple of points. One, in terms of the demand, 
Uh, AARP, and all of you know who AARP is, and all of you are afraid when you receive the letter of welcome to join AARP, because it means you are 50. But they survey their members every other year to really understand what are their priorities, what are their concerns, how they can be served better. For the last three years, number one or two concern has been how to stay mentally sharp. So they have been very active. How do we deliver new solutions for this group of people? So it's very important, I think, for all of you to have this into account. Uh, and that's why they have been active looking for cognitive training and cognitive assessments uh, in the marketplace that they can offer to their members. Uh, I think United Health is a sponsor of this conference. Uh, they are not doing anything like this, but I mean, I'm sure that that's going to be the next thing that ARP will tell United Health the opportunity is for them. So when we analyze market trends, and we analyze data since 2005, when the marketplace was only 200 million, and I'm talking revenues worldwide. So last year, for the first time, the worldwide revenues of companies in the space, so this is not just some crazy numbers, I can say it was three trillion dollars, no, this was actual revenues from companies, it crossed one billion last year. So it still starts to, to feel like a real industry, still emerging, still small, still confusing, but I mean, it's becoming uh, real. And if we just predict the same growth rate that has happened between 05 and last year, and between this year and 2020, and we think it's going to be even higher because these things tend to become higher, but uh, just assuming the same trajectory, we're talking about six billion by 2020, and we see for, there are four different segments of buyers of these technologies. Uh, the two where we already see more clear growth, one is consumers. It's people thinking, what do I do for myself? What do I do for my parents? What do I do for my kids? Is out of pocket money, most of it, but I mean, people are using their money for all kinds of random things. This is one that is getting more share of wallet. Second one that also is growing significantly is healthcare providers is healthcare providers realizing how this par is part of the health uh, mix. Let me give you another example. Right this year, Bayer, the big pharma company, is rolling out in 18 countries a web cognitive training website combined with Cognifit, an Israeli company, for patients with multiple sclerosis who will be offered both a drug-based treatment offered by Bayer and this online cognitive training tool. So this is, this is what is driving change. Uh, so consumers and healthcare providers are the two main areas of growth. But there is a couple of other, just for you to know, schools. Schools are increasingly adopting these tools from a variety of perspectives, often in special ed, how they help people with breathing problems or with behavioral problems. Pearson, the publisher, just acquired two years ago Cogmed, Cogmed Working Memory Training, and it's very interesting to talk to them how they are thinking how clinic clinicians will incorporate this tool in the practice, how schools will incorporate these tools in their day. And finally, employers. And the previous speakers also talked about corporate wellness. We start to see some large employers. Uh, we have seen, for example, Cisco and Accenture, National Insurance, is starting to introduce in their wellness programs a lot of these programs to better add a brain wellness dimension. So it's not only physical wellness, it starts from the brain and then goes down. So what are some of our predictions for this year? So again, there's so many things happening that don't often are not in the radar of the media or even in many conferences. So I'm happy that Jill was kind to invite me to, to talk with you today. So these things are already happening. So one is, we predict by the end of this year, in the US alone, there will be one million people who will have taken a self-assessment of cognitive function. And there is one iPad-based application called Brain Baseline, which started as a research project, and now is already getting huge adoption. Another one is problems with concussions and you know the NFL, and you know sports, it's already right now pretty standard that at the beginning of the season, 
everyone in the team gets, uh, and this is, by the way, I see many people taking pictures, is in the website as well, with a bit more detail. But in concussions, it's already very standard. There is a baseline, and after doing the season, if there is a concussion, they, they get compared to the baseline to understand what is the next step. I will just mention a few because I have to wrap up quickly. Uh, meditation, meditation is becoming the new yoga. Especially mindfulness is growing. Well, the opportunity is how can biometrics complement and enhance meditation? And we see a lot of, a lot of apps that you can have a sensor, either a basic sensor of heart rate variability in your earlobe or finger or more uh, in your brain, brain activity. And people are using this to accelerate learning about meditation. I mentioned a few of the other uh, examples already. Uh, Lumos Labs, the developer of a website called Lumosity, and uh, NeuroSky, both of them have the most revenues in the marketplace so far, and pretty healthy business models. So th by the end of this year, we think they can file for an IPO if they want to go that way. But again, this is already happening, and this is going to add much more interest from venture capital and angel investors. But we require a new mindset. This is not about medicine, health, brain health, mental health, as done traditionally. This is more about how digital brain health can really help at the massive scalable level, better monitor, assess, and enhance the brain health of everyone who has a brain, which happens to be everyone, right? So next step, so there's two things that maybe some of you may enjoy. One for everyone in the room. So we have a virtual summit in September where we invite the leading scientists and technology people worldwide. And we also have the report I just mentioned. So that's, an ex that's a discount, DHSS 13, for the executive pass in our website if you want to get all these materials. And then we just publish also, this is for consumers, because we want to educate them how to navigate these options. And it's also available in Amazon, everywhere you may want to take a look at. So thanks a lot. And I'm only 10 seconds over time. <laughs>